Chesed Shalom, my friends. My name is Ron Smith, and it is good to be with you. It is good. And uh, I tell you, we've uh, we've had a good Shavuot. I'm giving this on the, you know, just as Shavuot closes. And, uh, well, if you're unfamiliar with what I'm saying, Shavuot in Greek is called Pentecost. So I hope you've celebrated it uh, as a Pentecost, if you're a Pentecostal church. Otherwise, <laughs> well, okay, I won't go on with that. But nonetheless, it is really good to uh, to be here with you if you're listening in. And uh, let's pray before we get into this portion that we're dealing with. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at it. Heavenly Father, Avini, we just thank you so much for such a good time, such a, a wonderful season. A season that is just so full of meaning and so filled with your spirit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father. We are so grateful for all that you're doing as your spirit draws us closer to your word, your eternal word that you have written even on our hearts so that it may be walked out. And we are so grateful for what you have done. For all good things come from you. All good gifts come from you. You are such a wonderful giving God. So, thank you, Father, and we just ask that your Spirit would indeed lead us and guide us as we take a look at your eternal word. B'Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, folks, uh, we're looking uh, this week at the portion called Nassau. There's, oh, I, I tell you, I wish I could just take off on Shavuot, but I've only got so much time that I've paid for, and so <laughs> we will, uh, you know... You know, I would read Ruth to you, but you know we could take years to do that and study that. So let's go ahead and take just a real brief look at this portion uh, for the next two days. And you know, understanding that I'm just giving you a little bit of each portion, just as something to kind of guide you into uh, the the parts of the Bible that, as Christians, we may not read so much, but just to let you know, it's it's all one book. And also to encourage you, to poke a little bit of chutzpah into you. Now, you know, encourage may not always seem nice. It may not always seem complimentary or good sounding or sweet. But at the same time, I do want to poke some courage into you. Well, let's take a look at Numbers chapter 4. And this is the portion called Naso. Nassau is Numbers chapter 4, verse 21, all the way through chapter 7. That would be chapter 7, verse 89. We will take a look at this within two days. So, beginning at chapter 4, verse 21, I'll read through verse 28. It says, Adonai said to Moshe, Take a census of the descendants of Gershon also. By all those between 30 and 50 years old, all who enter the cores, the cores doing the work of serving in the tent of meeting, all those who enter the tzava, the army, doing the work of serving in the tent of meeting. The Gershon families are to be responsible for serving and for transporting loads. They are to carry the curtains of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, it's covering, the fine leather covering above it, the screen for the entrance to the tent of meeting, the tapestries for the courtyard, and the screen for the entrance to the courtyard by the tabernacle and around the altar. Along with the ropes and all the utensils they need for their service, and they are to do the work connected with these things. Aharon and his sons are to supervise all the work of the Gershon clan in transporting loads and serving and to assign them who is to carry a, who is to carry what this is how the gershon families are to serve in the tent of meeting and they are to be under the direction of itamar the son of ahron the Kohen. okay well i have referred to this particular piece that we're about to talk about just simply called serving in the army of worship serving in the army of worship kahat was given well, you could say, because he's carrying the utens the uh, furniture, 
uh, actually beginning with the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy Play, in the Holy of Holies, uh, you could say that Kahad has been given lethal responsibility. He's given this responsibility first, even though he's not the firstborn. And Kahat's duties are quite special. And we will remember Mr. Kahat, or as I think it's trans transliterated as Kohat in uh, most of your English Bibles. What I, uh, what I have finally caught up with, and this is me catching up with the Bible, what I have finally caught up with as I read this text is the reference to these clans as doing what they do. What they do is they do litzvo tzava. They do this, quote, to serve as the army. Litzvo tzava, to serve as the army. Or it could even be translated to war the warfare. So here I will point out that there are no arms being taken up. That is, this is not the kind of, you know, quote-unquote war of which we might customarily think. This is, this is a godly war. This is only the Father himself can command Israel to go and such as they did conquest, and that's the only thing that they did. That's the only time that they did a conquest of a piece of property. And other than that, only the king of the universe can arm himself to do war himself, to do the kind of war that we think of when we say war. And you will find that in scripture. Otherwise, when he tells us to do war, he's talking about worship. Okay? Second, the type of army we are speaking of is one of service to the Kohanim. The Levites were to serve the priest. The priesthood. The word for service, work, or worship is used nine times in these lines about Gershon with more to come with others. Others will, all the other clans will also have these same words used for them. So understand that the, the word avad means service, avad means work, and it also is used in the Bible for worship. So we will take a look at that. That is, this army doing warfare, if you will, is all about a worship of service to the priesthood and, of course, to the king of the multiverse. Again, when Adonai moves forward and when he stops, the clan of Gershon takes down and sets up the cloths, dismantling and loading onto wagons, as well as unloading and building again. All this is supervised by Itamar, son of Aharon the Kohen. And, you know, you might remember it. Tamar is also a town in Israel, just a little village, of not many more than a thousand people, right there in the middle of Shomron in Samaria, what politics calls the West Bank, what the Bible calls Israel. Let's take a look at Numbers chapter 4, verse 29 through 33. It says this, as for the descendants of Merari, take a census by clans and families of all these, or all those, pardon me, between 50, 30 and 50 years old. All who will be in the army doing the work of serving in the tent of meeting. Their service for the tent of meeting will be to carry the frames, crossbars, posts, and sockets of the tabernacle. Also the posts for the surrounding courtyard with their sockets, tent pegs, ropes, and other accessories and everything having to do with their service. You are to assign particular loads to specific persons by name. This is how the Merari families are to serve in the tent of meeting directed by Itamar the son of Aharon the Kohen. So again the clan of Kahat has removed now the Kodesh HaKodeshim Kahad has removed the most sacred items out the furniture, the the literally the the holy of holy furniture, from from the uh, the ark of the covenant to the altar of incense, the 
Menorah, and so forth, all of those are referred to in Hebrew by Kodesh HaKadoshim, especially holy. And then the clan of Gershon has removed the cloths which cover the Mishkan. So now we read about the clan of Merari, and that clan comes to dismantle the framework. And like other families or clans, Merari is called Tzava La'avod Et Avodot, Avodat, Ohel Ma'ed, literally meaning, <coughs> excuse me, an army for serving the service of the Tent of Intimate Meeting. Let me take a drink of this agua. Ah, uh, my, 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 my. So in all of these cases, with different families and different jobs, each case repeats the word avodah, meaning service, work, or worship, all again under the direction of Itamar, son of Aharon the Kohen. So again, we, we see that all of these three particular families, or clans as we commonly put it, are doing a, a service of worship, and I've said this, uh, I think, last week, that the, anything that you do can be worship to the Lord. It's just a matter of you making it that. It's just a matter of your frame of mind toward the thing that you are doing, and that elevates what you are doing. It, it elevates that to a level that uh, really calls you to do it well. And so it is with these three families here. They're doing work of moving stuff around, but they are to see it as worship, and they are an army worshiping the Lord. Well, now we come to numbering these folks, and we'll start again with Kahat, and we'll read about the, that particular number in Numbers, chapter 4, verse 34 through 37. It reads something like this. Moshe, Aharon, and the community, community leaders took a census of the descendants of Kahat by their clans and families. All those between 30 and 50 years old who were part of the army serving in the tent of meeting. Registered by their families, they numbered 2,750. These are the ones counted from the Kahat families of all those serving in the tent of meeting, whom Moshe and Aharon enumerated in keeping with the order given by Adonai through Moshe. The census of the descendants of Gershon. Well, I'll, I'll read about that later. Let's stop and say just a little bit about Kahad and his numbers. The numbering of each family or clan also comes with a summary of the whole layout of service as well. Again, age limits are set from 30 to 50 years for this holy service. Of these, the number is called Kol Haba La Tzava La Avodah Be'ohel Mo'ed. Literally translated, all who will come in for the army of service in the tent of intimate meeting. All who will come in for the army of service in the tent of intimate meeting. This army of service is for worshiping the Lord. All who came in numbered 2,750. Well, let's take a look at the numbering of Gershon. Numbers chapter 4, verses 38 through 41. The census of the descendants of Gershon by the clans and families, all those between 30 and 50 years old, who were part of the army serving in the tent of meeting, yielded 2,630 registered by their clans and families. These are the ones counted from the families of the descendants of Gershon, of all those serving in the tent of meeting, whom Moshe and Aharon enumerated in keeping with the order given by Adonai. Alpi Adonai. Well, the phrase appears also for Gershon. Kol haba la tzava la vado be'ohel mo'ed. Again. Literally translated, all who will enter, all who will enter in for the army of service in the tent of intimate meeting, ages 30 to 50. And all who came in for this particular family of Gershon numbered 2,630. Well, we're going to number Merari now. 
Numbers chapter 4, verses 42 through 45. It says, The senses of the families of the descendants of Merari, by their clans and families, all those between 30 and 50 years old, who were part of the corps, the army, serving in the tent of meeting, yielded 3,200, registered by their families. These are the ones counted from the families of the descendants of Merari, whom Moshe and Aharon enumerated in keeping with the order given by Adonai through Moshe. Well, I have one sentence here. The family of Merari, that is all those of ages 30 to 50, and uh, the phrase again, Kol haba la tzava la avoda be'ohel moed, all who will enter in for the army of service in the tent of intimate meeting, this time numbered 3,200. Well, uh, to give a summary of summarizing, <laughs> let's go to Numbers chapter 4, verses 46 through 49. It goes something like this to finish off that chapter. The senses of the Levi'im, of the Levites, whom Moshe, Aharon, and the leaders of Israel enumerated by their clans and families, all those between 30 and 50 years old, who were part of those working to serve and working to carry loads in the tent of meeting, yielded a total of 8,580 persons. According to Adonai's order, they were appointed by Moshe, each one to his specific service or work, and they were also enumerated as Adonai ordered Moshe. Okay, well, there are two phrases you've probably noticed. There are two phrases, perhaps three, that I would like to point out just one more time. One, in verse 47, that is, uh, I just read it here, it says, All those between 30 and 50 years old, Kol haba la'avod avodat avoda va'avodat masa be'ohel ma'ed. Now, that's a lot of re repetition of the word avodah. All who entered for serving the service of the service and the service of carrying loads in the tent of intimate meeting. Again, these forms of the word avodah mean service, work, and worship, and all these servers quote-unquote carry loads as their service of worship to the Lord. When, when you find a sentence in the Bible that actually, actually repeats a word, let's see, one, two, three, four times in a short statement, you know that the Lord is trying to say something. He's really trying to get something across that we can serve yes even in your local congregation you can serve and that service can be a means of worshiping the lord you can elevate that service you can elevate what you do be it cleaning restrooms being a janitor being an electrician moving tables uh you know i don't know what what it is that you might do i'm just listing things that i have done but you can you can elevate that particular thing to something you can it can be mundane but you can elevate it from that place to something more grand and that's up to you well another phrase that i have only alluded to once alpi adonai pakad otam bayad moshe literally means by the mouth of adonai they were counted and by the hand of moshe now, you'll see this translated in, in various ways, but I'm giving you a literal, straight-across translation. Now, this is very similar to a phrase throughout Torah. Torah comes to us, al pi Adonai, that is, by his mouth. You know, he, in other words, he authored it. He speaks it directly from his mouth to Moshe. And it comes, biyad Moshe, by the hand of Moshe, that is, he wrote it down. The Lord inspired Torah. He put his, his spirit authored Torah right out of his mouth. Remember, he breathed his spirit into mankind. Right out of his mouth comes the spirit which makes Torah, and Moshe wrote it down on lambskin. Most usually you'll read that as the Torah of Moses. What it literally says is the Torah by the hand of Moses. That is, he wrote it down. Moses didn't make this up. 
Moses didn't uh, grab something out of the blue. He was getting it directly spoken to him from the king of the universe. All he did was write down the words that the Lord spoke. Well, let's talk about, for a little bit, hospitals on the outskirts of town. Numbers chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Adonai said to Moshe, Order the people of Israel to expel from the camp everyone with Zara'at, everyone with a discharge, and, and whoever is unclean because of touching a, cor a corpse. Both male and female you must expel. Uh, put them outside the camp so that they won't defile their camp where I live among you. The people of Israel do, did this and put them outside the camp. The people of Israel did what Adonai had said to Moshe. Well, this is where we get a very important, uh, um, a very important matter in uh, civilization across the world. Well, in most most good places, history of the Dark Ages tells us that uh, some folks began checking out this book called Leviticus back in the Dark Ages. You know, no one had certainly read Leviticus. In fact, uh, we still don't read that book, but I thought I would take you through it. But somebody opened it up, and they decided to do things like bathing. Another important idea adopted from Vayikra, or Leviticus, is called the hospital. The queue was adopted from Leviticus, and it was and is not only a hospitable place, but also a place outside the camp, outside the town. It was originally, wherever you go around, at least in the, in the United States, the hospital was just out on the edge of the city limits. And then cities grow and they take over that area. But in Leviticus, this is done until the Lord heals the Tsarua, the, um, the person with a contagious infection. The, the hospital is traditionally placed outside the city until medical doctors or pr practitioners can heal the individual in uh, you know, the way it works out in society today. But, you know, I thought I'd kind of let you know that that's where hospitals came from is because somebody opened up Leviticus and uh, I'm just reading it to you also in Numbers and this section of Numbers and this will be uh, Numbers chapter 5 verses 1 through 8 actually 1 through 10 this is really setting us up for a story to be tell, told these, are, these will be things within these few verses that we've already read about in Leviticus but we've read about another thing in Exodus, specifically Exodus 32, and we will take a look at that as well. Um, yeah, even today, I believe. So, let's go ahead and read Leviticus, or Leviticus Numbers chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. It says, Adonai said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel, When a man or a woman commits any kind of sin against another person, and thus breaks faith with Adonai, he incurs, incurs guilt. He must confess the sin which he has committed, and he must take or make full restitution for his guilt. Add 20% and give it to the victim of his sin. But if the person has no relative to whom restitution can be made for the guilt, then what is given in restitution for guilt will belong to Adonai, that is, to the Kohen. In addition to the ram of atonement through which Adonai, or pardon me, through through which atonement is made for him. Every firstborn which the people of Israel consecrate and present to the Kohen will belong to an individual consecration to his own to allocate him to the moon. But what the person gives to the Kohen will belong to him. Well, Hebrew here, Lima Ol Ma'al We have um, we have also spoken at some length of this matter in Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter five, verse twenty through twenty-six, as well as chapter six, verse one through seven. Uh, actually, that all flows together in the Hebrew text. But uh, we we spoke of this. It's uh, a, little, a little bit difficult to read because it's a really hurtful. It, uh, Ma'al means a betrayal, and it's a it's a betrayal of the Lord. But you always it's always used as you 
get at somebody, you get at a, a believer, someone who is following the Lord, you betray that person in order to betray the Lord because you're trying to get at the Lord himself through his people. But that's the word ma'al. And it always is doubled. It, the word is always uh, two, two words side by side that mean the same thing. So, in this case, of someone who sins against you by breaking faith with Adonai, this is the, the guilt offering, the asham, or matter of shame. Leviticus also specifies offerings, while Numbers here focuses on the need for payment, for paying restitution. Restitution, a 20% addition to the cost of a shame offering. If restitution cannot be made to the victim of a or victim's family it is paid to the sanctuary being as the Lord is a spirit you can't pay him you know restitution in the form of, of money and that sort of thing so it's paid to the sanctuary and restitution is something that we you know it's a little bit of a, a mature matter we talk a lot about grace 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 and forgiveness, 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 and that is wonderful and marvelous and a, an absolute must, but there's also restitution. Uh, King David was forgiven. Nathan said, you'll be forgiven for this thing that you did, killing Bathsheba's wife and so forth, but you're going to have to pay some restitution. There's forgiveness, and restitution is spelled differently. So, and no, don't, don't confuse, don't make a fuss about giving to the Kohanim. If you don't like giving your restitution to folks you didn't uh, directly affect, don't commit ma'al ma in the first place. Don't commit a betrayal in the first place. Numbers chapter 5, verse 1 through 10, sets us up for a story about a quote-unquote man and an unfaithful quote-unquote wife, neither of which are here identified, though there is an illusion of identification elsewhere. So let's talk about the unfaithful wife. Numbers chapter 5, 11 through 31. And I will also make reference to Exodus chapter 32, verses 19 through 29. Now, there is a certain amount of numbers that is largely based on ye old golden calf fiasco. There's a, a certain amount of of stuff within numbers, I should say, that is based on the old golden calf fiasco. But uh, here I will give you a, a Hebrew line, some translation. It says, Daber el bene Yisrael ve amarta elahem ish ish. It says, Speak into the descendants of Israel and say to them, Amen, Amen, Amen. Yes, a man's wife goes astray. Uma'al, uma'al ma'al. She commits a breach of faith into him. Into him. He feels that. Vishakhav ish ota shekva zera. The man lies down. He lies down with seed. And the story here presented does not begin with the word if. You know, you'll read, it says, if a man, you know, if a man's wife is unfaithful to him. The Hebrew word if is not in the text. It simply tells a story about a man sleeping with another man's wife, hiding said matter from her husband. No one is around who may be a witness to this going astray, so a test will be presented to determine if her husband is losing his sanity or if his wife is indeed an adulterous woman. We are again reminded that no one speaks up, including the wife. No one here is saying a thing. No one's going to be a witness, and the wife herself will not defend herself. Barley flour becomes an offering given for remembering, it says, for remembering guilt, specifically. This is not calling to mind forgiven guilt. This is not guilt that's been forgiven. This is possible guilt that has not yet been repented from. Forgiveness follows repentance. Okay, This is just simply a test done to see if, if she has actually been, has been unfaithful 
and thus acted in betrayal. The woman of alleged adultery, and again, we're not told who. This is there's no if. This is actually a story told. Just just told for, uh, you could say entertainment, but really to, to call to mind something. The woman of alleged adultery is brought before the judge of all mankind, holy water, that is water from the laver, which represents the eternal word of God, the Bible, is put into a clay pot. Then dust, of which is mankind, dust is mankind, is put into the holy laver water. The Kohen is to unbind the woman's hair. Fallen angels, perhaps even the Kohen, may be tempted toward the woman. How might she respond to that person being tempted? The Kohen himself will hold in his hand, quote, the water of embitterment and cursing, unquote, while the woman in question holds barley flour. The woman is to testify, swearing with an oath that includes a curse, she, when she drinks the water, her, it says her private parts will shrivel and her abandon, uh, abdomen, pardon me, her private parts will shrivel and her abdomen, her womb, will swell. Her private parts is her womb, pardon me, and her abdomen, her stomach will swell, uh, should she be guilty, that is, of an adulterous breach of faith. If these things do not occur, she is declared innocent and will go on to have children. This is the Torah, the teaching concerning jealousy. The text will say, this is the teaching concerning jealousy. Interesting. But who is the wife and who is the husband? The guiltless husband. It will say the husband is not guilty. It actually says that in the text. The husband is not guilty. We're just testing to see if he actually, if his jealousy is actually felt for a reason. Perhaps I might ask, perhaps I'll ask it this way. How did the Levites know in Exodus chapter 32 in the golden calf incident? How did the Levites know whom to put to the sword as recorded in Exodus chapter 32? You will recall Moses said, Oh, actually, Moses, well, here, I'll just go on with my questions. 3,000 people out of a few million died that day. How did the Levi'im, how did the Levites know whom to slay? What gave it away? In this story, reflecting a time when Moshe ground some gold dust, ground some gold into dust, throwing the dust into the water, and making the people drink that water. You remember the story in Exodus 32. He ground gold of the golden calf to dust. He threw the dust in the water, in water, and he made people drink the water. Okay, we've read, I could read, you know, the rest of Numbers 5 to you. But you probably know the story. She is made to drink water that has dust thrown in it to see if she is an adulterous woman. We know if she is an adulterous woman if her stomach swells. So again, who again is this gold dust woman of Numbers chapter 5? She's not named, the husband's not named, it does not say if a man's husband or man's wife goes astray. There's no if in the text, it is a story presented. Who is it? Well, in summary again, King David did what he seemingly had to do, namely fighting wars. King David's apparent dream was to build up the Kohanim. You'll find that in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. He built up the priesthood. He built up the Levites in 1 Chronicles chapter 25. He built up the gatekeepers in 1 Chronicles 26 and the military in 1 Chronicles 27. In this particular setting, this morning, let us have some speaks about the Levites of chapter 25. Okay? And I'm just, I'm, you can read about it. I'm just presenting this stuff to you. I, uh, I could go into great detail and we could talk for weeks, months, years. I'm just presenting this to you. I only have purchased so much time. 
Part of the work or worship that is that of prophesying. Okay, the Levites, according to 1 Chronicles 25, they were to prophesy, and they were to prophesy with musical instruments. That's how they were to prophesy. Musical instruments, not with the mouth. The word prophet is a Greek word. In Greek, it's simply pronounced prophetis. And it's, uh, it basically means, quote, and I have partial quotes, this is my stuff here, it means one who speaks forth or speaks openly. Okay. And this Greek word covers the Hebrew word rare, which means a seer, right, as well as the word nabi. And it's the word nabi that I would like to take a look at a little bit more closely. It is agreed across the board that a prophet is one on whom the spirit of Adonai rests. But the Hebrew word has an interesting identity in its basic form. We, we read of a fellow named Barnabas within the apostolic writings. His name is Hebraic, not surprisingly, and is spelled with the same basic spelling as the word for prophet. Okay, it's the same word. We are further told that the name given to this Levi, to this Levite, means, quote, son of exhortation. You might read it that way, or you might read son of encouragement. The King James has son of consolation. His name was Yosef, but he was also an encourager, you know, a prophet. And the first time the word prophet is mentioned is in Genesis chapter 20, verse 7, when the Lord told a man to go and have Abraham pray, go and go to Abraham and he will pray for you. Why is he going to pray for you? Because he's a prophet. It's not because he has some special power, but because he is an encouraging man. And his encouragement for you will be that he's going to pray for you. Okay? So, I know that the Greek word means to speak forward. I'm giving you the Hebrew word, not the Greek word. The, the Hebrew word is Navi, and it actually has more to do with encouragement, to exhort or encourage, to plant some chutzpah into somebody. We also learn from the Levites of First Chronicles 25 that instrumentalists are to prophesy by the directing of the king, says al Yadei HaMelech. That is what you know, by by the hand of or the direction of the king. And and what better king than Adonai, Adonai Yeshua himself? In fact, with lyre in hand, a lyre or lyre is a guitar, okay? Uh, guitar is a Persian word, and uh, lyre is an English word. It all means the same thing. So with uh, guitar in hand, it says they... Quote, prophesied thanks and praise to Adonai. They encouraged in the direction of the Lord, and that encouragement in the direction of the Lord was thanks and praise to Him. Guess where that encouragement actually fell? It fell on the people. Okay? The Lord Himself does not need to be encouraged, but the people do. Okay. This includes sons and daughters. Now, they encouraged with, uh, with a lyre, with a guitar in hand. That's, that's the way they encouraged. It wasn't so much with their mouth or their great singing, even though the Levites were singers. But they, their encouragement was with their instrumentation. Now this included, quote-unquote, sons and daughters. And you can also read about that in Ezra chapter 2, verse 65, and Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 67. Uh, the, the Levites that ministered included both sons and daughters. And it may, even if they were, it says they were, could have been great or small, they could have been teacher or Talmud, teacher or student. It didn't matter. Remember, the Levites were called clan by family and so forth, all who would come into the service, all who would come into the service, and all who would come into the army, all who came into the army were invited, but not everybody came in. 
This is an army of singer sewers and singing seers. This is an army of people who have eyes to see, and see in the Bible means to perceive, not merely with your physical eye. It means to perceive, to be perceptive. And a prophet is one who sees and is perceptive toward who needs to be encouraged. Let's talk about a, a fellow by the name of Cana. Did you know that the Bible speaks of a, a person by the name of Cana? We are told throughout the Tanakh, throughout the, uh, we would call it the Old Testament, that the Lord is a quote-unquote jealous God. Throughout the Bible, he is called a jealous God. In fact, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, that's right after the golden calf incident, we are told that his very name is Cana, which means jealous or zealous. And he is not at all ashamed to say so. No, he, he'll let you know right up front, hey, my name is Jealous. He intends to cleanse us via the washing in the water of the word. Even his spoken word, the Greek word there is rhema in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 28. Rather than be silent or off-putting, may we be responsive to his work of cleansing. For he is calling us to a higher purpose, my friends. The song of the Levite is, Come in to the house of the Lord and come share in my portion. Come share in my portion. See, Levi was not given a portion of land. Levi was given a portion of the Lord himself. And Levi calls to all who are in the land, come and share in this portion with me. That's the real portion. And you can do the work, even as an army of worshipers, and you can elevate whatever, you're, whatever the work is that you're doing to a higher level called worshiping the Lord. And let your instrumentation be encouraging. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, folks, just wanted to talk to you for a little bit about this portion. We'll talk some more tomorrow. And we'll go into chapter 6 and chapter 7 and uh, looking forward to doing that with you. Just a little bit of encouragement to give to you. Thank you and Shalom.